to provide a brief introduction to her uh, herself, her work and experiences, uh, and then go ahead with her talk. Dr. Asma, please go ahead. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. My name is Asma Chima. I'm working as the medical director at one of the subacute care, long-term care facility in Maryland. And last year, I was working with University of Maryland Shore Regional Health, and I work in the as attending physician in an ICU setting as well. So before starting today's talk, I would like to bring up, uh, share with some screen with you guys. We have the facility, right? We can do that, right? Okay. So today we're gonna to talk about the CDC guidelines. And as we know, they are changing pretty rapidly in the last few weeks. And I'm gonna start very basic stuff. So anyone from Pakistan as a G, working at the GP level can understand and of course consultant can help us as well. So I wanna start with first Quranic verses. Why is a maritu fahuwa yashfeen? Can we, I don't know what's not going next slide. Is there something uh, we have to do at your end? No, I think uh, just click on the slides again and then uh, go use the next up. There we go. Okay, got it. Thank you. So again, Bismillah Rahman Rahim. Uh, I'm going to start with the Quranic verse. It says, Waiza maritu yashfin, And when I am ill, it is he who cures me. So as we all know, we are going through a tough time and we have to work on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with all our help, with everyone's help. We'll go through it. And uh, in other words, says in the Usra Yusra, with every hardship comes ease. By saying that, we are here to share learning with each other to keep this virus part out and be vigilant and work as a team. Uh, of course, here in the States and in Pakistan as well. And you know, with team together, everyone achieves more. So today, I'm going to talk very briefly about CDC guidelines. But before going there, I'm going to share with you the Johns Hopkins data that shows how many confirmed cases we have. Uh, as of today. So these are the numbers we have, total confirmed cases uh, all over the world. It uh, is more than 1 million has been confirmed and total deaths has been more than 58,000. And it's really alarming at this point. So I'm gonna go region-wise, uh, United States is at the top right now, more than 266,000 cases has been confirmed. Then second is 119,000 cases in Italy, then Spain, 117,000 cases has been reported, and Germany and China and so forth. So if we look at the United States, so New York is at epicenter at this time, more than 102 cases has been confirmed, and uh, then New Jersey, they are next to each other, then third, California, and so forth. Now I'm gonna talk about the Pakistan. Today, as of today, we have 2,637 cases has been confirmed so far, based on this Johns Hopkins data available as of today. So you can see this map, all this, most on the New York state on the east side, then scattered all over the state, but both cases on the east side, New York, New Jersey, Maryland, all these states. So everyone talking about the social distancing these days, and as you can see, the flatten the curve. So what does that mean? Because you can see over here, the healthcare system capacity is over here. And with the rising number of cases, we are over here. So this, that's the issue everyone talking about, that flatten the curve, keep the social distancing so we can flatten the curve to help as many cases as possible. So pretty quick, the CDC mentioned about a clinical presentation, incubation period for COVID-19 is 14 days with median time of four to five days from exposure to symptom onset. And presentation is, is really variable. Since beginning, it was fever, cough, shortness of breath. Now there are a lot of atypical symptoms as well. But since still, fever is at the top. It's about 83 to 99% of the cases. Then cough, 59 to 82%. Fatigue, 44 to 70%. Anorexia, 40 to 84%. Shortness of breath. And then phlegm production. And atypical symptoms are GI symptoms. And they can occur more than 40% of the cases. And clinical course, uh, based on illness and severity, there's the largest cohort study done in China in the, that showed more than 44,000 that were positive with COVID show that illness severity can range from mild to critical. So mild to moderate cases are 81%, that's a good thing. And the severe cases are 14% and critical cases are 5%. And that study shows that overall case fatality was 2.3%. And fatality rate among the critical patients was 49%. But the numbers I showed you before in the Johns Hopkins data, as of today, it showed the mortality rate 
a mortality rate is 5.3% based on that John Hopkins data we have as of today. So that is really alarming. And the risk factors we all know, uh, age is the strongest risk factor. And uh, of course, it's coming in all age groups, but mostly, uh, I think more than 14% was uh, above age 80, and then 10% and 6%, and of course, all age groups are there, but of course, more elderly people are more affected with COVID-19. And of course, uh, elderly patients have a, a lot of comorbidities, and even young population who has comorbidities, two or more chronic conditions, uh, having COVID positive, and they go to from uh, severe to critical case. So diagnostic testing, we are doing over here these days, PCR and viral RNA. We obtained by the nasopharyngeal samples obtained, and uh, it takes about three to four days these days, but patients who are intubated in the critical care, uh, I have a couple of patients from my center. Uh, one is admitted last night, overnight, and I'm falling um, with the ICU attending, and I have access online. I can review what's going on. He's still intubated, and his COVID test came back. Uh, it's, a, it's negative. That's a really good thing. So we were all concerned and the result came back within 24 hours, but other cases taking three to four days, but another case we did last week is still pending. And another way to detect RNA is in stool and the blood. And detection of RNA in blood may be a mark of the severe illness. So we are not doing routinely blood testing over here, but most likely the PCR RNA testing is done over here so far. And FDA just recently approved a few days ago, first coronavirus antibody test in the USA. And this test looks for the protective antibodies with a finger prick uh, we can do that and uh, it's really a uh, fast uh, results the results deliver within 15 minutes and we look for the two antibodies uh, igm and igg the lab findings uh, most common was the lymphopenia in most lab findings as found in 83 percent of the hospitalized patients then neutrophilia, uh, neutrophilia transaminitis uh, elevated ldh and then uh, elevated inflammatory markers crp and the ferritin level the radiographic findings, uh, chest x-ray demonstrate most of the time bilateral airspace consolidation. And uh, in the initial cases, chest x-ray is unremarkable in early uh, disease process. And CT images was done in few cases that showed bilateral peripheral ground glass opacities, but CT chest uh, is, is not as that, that diagnostic value. And the uh, American College of Cardiology Radiology does not recommend CT for screening at this time. So there are some few medications that we're talking about for the last few days and for the last few weeks that we have to stop or we have to continue that I'm gonna talk a little bit more about it. Of course, we talked yesterday, talk as well uh, with the cardiologists on our panel. So ACE inhibitor and ARBs. So there's no scientific data available to stop it. And there is no link suggested that there's a link between ACE inhibitors and ARBs with the worst COVID-19 outcome. And the American Heart Association and the American College of Cardiology recommending continuation of these drugs in patients who have the heart failure, hypertension, ischemic heart disease. The reason suggesting is outweigh uh, because they benefit more than a risk in those patients. So there is no data showing that we have to stop these medicines. And another, uh, talk, we're talking about NSAIDs. And there's again, no scientific data available at this time that NSAIDs may worsen COVID-19 clinical outcome. And the steroids are not recommended in COVID positive patients. So clinical management, again, varies from mild to moderate and severe cases. And the patient with mild to moderate uh, disease can stay at home, but it again, based on clinical presentation, it depends on the clinical requirement for the supportive care. It depends how much uh, supportive care they ha have available at home and ability of the patient to self-isolate at home. So it again varies from uh, case to case. Again, in Pakistan and United States, again, we have a lot of population in a rural area. So we have to be very uh, uh, careful in those cases. And uh, of course, uh, rural areas will, will be uh, God forbidden if uh, it hits and that, it, thank God so far, there are not much cases reported as compared to uh, Western world. So uh, God is good thing at this point, but we have to be very vigilant and careful about it. And with those patients that has been quarantined in home for mild to moderate cases should be monitored closely for the risk for, of progression to severity. And in, in severe disease, patients require hospitalization. And there's a reason that I showed you curve before that flattened the curve because if more patients will be admitted and we have healthcare system does not have that many resources, does not have that capacity to accommodate everyone. So complications we are most familiar about is cause hypoxic respiratory failure, ARDS can cause sepsis, septic shock, cardiomyopathy, arrhythmia, acute renal failure. And corticosteroids have been widely used in hospitalized patients in China. And, but however, the benefits of corticosteroids uh, use is not determined based upon uncontrolled observational data. 
So that's why it's not recommended to use steroids in COVID positive patients. So um, I will talk briefly about the management of the COVID-19 positive patients uh, while they're admitted uh, inpatient. So again, uh, it revolves around the supportive management, as we all know, and the, most of the complications we manage. And the, there's a WHO and Surviving Sepsis campaign, campaign have both released comprehensive guidelines for the inpatient and critically ill patients, so how to manage them. And of course, supplementary oxygen, we can put them on, and based on indication, uh, mechanical ventilation support. And clinical trials are still underway across the globe regarding uh, any approved medications. And recently, uh, FDA uh, uh, approves to we can give hydroxychloroquine, but still uh, there's the not pro no proven data available. But there's no other option at this time. And there is one other investigation agent, um, Remedisevir, currently in use, but is still under investigation. It is IV drug with broad, uh, broad antiviral activity that inhibits a viral application, but is still under investigation at this point. So as we mentioned about that FDA authorizes anti-malaria drugs, uh, but hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine has been authorized across the country, over here in states, to slow the disease uh, process in CSA patients, not recommended for the outpatient care. So it's very important to understand that in primary care settings, I will not recommend to uh, start at this point and the randomized controlled trial observing many patients already on hydroxychloroquine have been presented with COVID positive. So we have to be very careful given side effects of hydroxychloroquine. And uh, there are many therapies that still under investigation, but there is no current proven um, data modality available at this time. And hydroxychloroquine, we talked about yesterday uh, about the side effects, prolonged QT syndrome in patients with hepatic failure and renal dysfunction. So in seriously in patients who, have, who are hospitalized and intubated, in those uh, scenarios, we can start it's because it has been authorized by the FDA, but we have to monitor for the QT prolongation. How we can do that, we can discontinue the other medications like antipsychotics who can cause QT prolongation. And we have to monitor very closely like every six to eight hours EKG monitoring. And of course, Halter monitor is on board when patient is in an ICU setting. So I want to talk about very briefly the basic vent management, like uh, God forbidden, if uh, we go in that route that we all GPs or um, Pakistan or states or other specialties need to jump in to help uh, our uh, colleagues. So it's very basic uh, uh, vent setting I'm going to go over. And of course, we have an uh, intensivist on board. They will talk sometimes uh, in the near future, maybe tomorrow they will talk about it. And they are on board, I think, a couple of those we have today. And if anything, we can ask them as well. So pretty basically, we have three modes of ventilation. Uh, one is volume control. It's called ACVC mod, assist control, volume control. We have a pressure control called assist control, pressure control. And third one is a pressure control. So I'm going to talk more about the volume control. It's a basic mode of vent settings that we all should be aware of it if we all need to help to save someone's life. So volume control mode is a, it's a vent setting is called mode. So we have to set up on the volume control mode and the respiration we set, we set at, uh, initially we set at 15 and it can be from varies from 12 to 20. But initially we can start with 15 and tidal volume is based on six, six ml per kilogram ideal body weight. This is based on the height. So this is very careful about the uh, tidal volume. And then we have a peak, peak and expiratory pressure. We initially start at five. And of course, we can adjust based on the patient clinical scenario. And FiO2, we start at 100%. So this is the basic vent setting we can put on. God forbidden, intensivist is not on board, or is not on board. So it's basically for non-intensivist. We can jump in and we can start on these basic initial settings. Uh, so again, we can save life and then we can consult the intensivist and get their uh, expert opinion. So on these, the respiratory rate and tidal volume, I'm going to explain a little bit, uh, of course, just refresh. I know my medical school will all read about it. I managed my few of my patients in ICU last year when I was working with the University of Maryland Shore Regional Health setup. So respiratory rate and tidal volume, basically uh, parameters up for uh, oxygenation parameters. Sorry, it's for um, ventilation parameters. It's, uh, and PEEP and FiO2 tells us about the oxygenation parameters. So these are the two things we can uh, uh, evaluate. These are the vent settings. Then patient is on the vent, and then we have to monitor the patient. So what we see in the patient, that how patient is doing on those vent settings. So we see the respiratory rate. We check the oxygen saturation. We check the ABGs. And then there are two important pressures we check is the peak airway pressure and the plateau pressure. 
that is very important. We need to uh, keep an eye on those uh, pressures because uh, they are monitored by the tidal volume. I'm gonna show the graph on the next slide. So this is a normal pressure time curve. You can see over here, this is the peep that start, start at five. So this is the initial setting. We can start on the vent, basic vent setting. And uh, this is peak inspiratory pressure. It should be between uh, 20 to 25. And then plateau pressure should not exceed more than 30 centimeter of water. And then uh, we can see over here, I could just put up, for example, patient has a respiratory rate of 16, oxygen saturation of 98%, EBG 7.25, 60, 69. So 7.25, it tells, tells us acidosis, 60 is a PCO2, 69 is a PO2. And peak pressure is 32 and pressure pressure is 28. So it tells us we already max out over here and we have a six CO2 to blow out. So how we can do that? So in this case, if we increase the respiratory rate, so we can blow off a CO2 and then we can check ABG again and monitor how patient is doing instead of going with the, this is the tidal volume. So we have to be very careful with the tidal volume because of lung protective ventilation. So there are two things we have to keep in mind to protect the lung protective ventilation, the tidal volume and the plateau pressure. That is very important that we talk about should not exceed more than 30 uh, centimeter of water. So this is the basic uh, vent settings. And the main thing, what else I was I wanna talk about the peak pressure and the plateau pressure. What are, what is the peak pressure? The peak pressure represents basically the airway resistance. What does that mean? It means that whenever uh, any of uh, our trachea and large bronchi, the first initial uh, uh, air goes into them. That is the call peak pressure. And uh, this is called airway resistance as well. So sometimes if peak pressure is high, uh, so what are the causes? What can cause the peak pressure to be up? So we have to think about it. It can be something in trachea, something in the bronchioles, right? So what it can be? It can be mucus plugging, Right, it can set some secretions in the mucus uh, in the uh, trachea. So tracheal secretions. What we can do, we can do uh, trach aspirations to help. Let's see if it helps. Then other thing, what can happen? Uh, and the trachea patient on uh, vent can have a, a kinked ET, ET endotracheal tube. So we can uh, see how to fix the ET to make sure uh, why uh, peak pressure is high. Then other things that can cause uh, peak pressure high is the bronchial uh, constriction. Or what can cause it? Or any obstructive lung disease can cause it. So these are the things we have to consider when we think of peak pressures going up. And normally, we, for the mucus plugging, we, use, we do the bronchoscopy, but in a, a COVID-positive patient, it's not recommended given aerosolization. So we have to avoid bronchoscopy in patients with COVID-positive, and we should not use uh, bronchoscopy uh, for this case. And then we have to talk about uh, plateau pressure. What is that? So that is a pressure in the alveoli. So we, we call it as a lung compliance as well. And we are, I already talked about it should be less than 30 centimeter of water and anything that can fill alveoli increases the pressure, pressure. So what are those causes? So we have to think about it. What can cause alveoli, uh, this pressure to be high? So what can go in the alveoli? It can be pneumonia. It can be uh, fibrosis. Uh, pulmonary edema can cause it. Any inflammatory process can cause it, like ARDS can cause it. So we also need to think about any uh, causes that pushing outside the alveoli. It can be uh, pneumothorax, it can be pleural effusion. So we have to think on those lines why the pressure is high. So we have to be very careful because these are the parameters managing the lung protective ventilation we're talking about. So this uh, very briefly about the uh, um, vent setting for the volume control. I'm gonna talk br very briefly for the pressures. It's a little bit complicated. I will leave this for the intensivist, but I'm going to pretty uh, quick go over it. Um, this mode, again, mode setting, we change to ACPC. This is the assist control, pressure control. Respiration rate we set for 12 PI. PI is an inspiratory pressure. So over there, we have the tidal volume. So over here, we have a PI. So that is the difference. So this PI creates a tidal volume. Over there, in the vent setting, we were doing the tidal volume. In the pressure control setting, we are doing the PI and P the same with five and by five to 100%. And this is how this event setting in the pressure control. And then we monitor the patient, how patient is doing on these settings. And then again, we check on the patient respiratory rate, tidal volume, oxygen saturation, and ABG. These are the indi uh, clinical indicators tell us how patient is uh, doing clinically on these vent settings. And I will not go on the pressure control detail. I will leave this for the intensivists to talk more about it as needed, but we have to be careful if God forbid, if we need to jump in to help our colleagues. So all the specialists and, and on GP level can help with the basic settings. And this is the ACPC pressure time curve. So you can see over here, this is the P again five, and this is the a PI. I talk about inspiratory pressure is 15. 
And the vent settings over here, we set up respiratory rate of 18, PI of 15, PEEP again 5, FO2 100%. So we can see over here patient, uh, so how we will monitor the patient. So we'll check the patient respiratory rate, tidal volume. So ideal tidal volume looks like 300, it's a little bit on the lower side, right? And oxygen saturation 95%, ABG again 7.2, 60 is the PCO2, 75 is the PO2. So we can see again CO2 is on the high side. So how we can improve uh, this by changing the vent settings? So very basically, very quick, tidal volume is low. So how we can, and I said, in the pressure control setting, the inspiratory pressure is creating the tidal volume. So we can go up. So 15, we can go up in 20 to make the tidal volume to go up to help improve the uh, acidotic state of the patient. So pretty quick, I'm gonna go over the surviving sepsis campaign. Uh, again, uh, intensivists will talk more about it. I will just have a couple of slides to talk about. There's our three bundle and our six bundle. So sepsis bundle three hour means to be completed within three hours of time of the presentation. And what is the time of presentation? It defines the time of triage in the emergency department or any setting patients presented to the clinical provider, healthcare provider. So what are we supposed to do? Make the lactate level right away, obtain blood cultures prior to administration of antibiotics, administer broad spectrum antibiotics. We are using over here IV, vancomycin, which cover the uh, gram positive and MRSA. And for IV zocin, we use over here for gram negative and anaerobic coverage until the patient don't have any allergies to end these antibiotics. And then of course, we have to administer 30 ml per kilogram of crystallite for hypertension or lactate level more than four, but we have to be very careful in COVID positive patients for the fluid overload. So this guidelines, we can talk more with the intensivist to manage how to, with the fluid wise, how we have to um, manage the patient with the COVID positive. And sepsis bundle six hour to be completed within six hours of the time period of the presentation. And we can apply the pressors to maintain the mean arterial pressure of 65 millimeter of mercury. And uh, even uh, we use pressors when we see that fluid, uh, patient is not responding to fluid resuscitation. And of course, we have to reassess the volume status and tissue, tissue perfusion. We can check the capillary fills and all this. We can uh, and also remedy the lactate level if initial lactate level is elevated. So a couple of days ago, a pretty quick one, someone asked from the Pakistan about uh, how to disinfect the, uh, your facility and some, if someone comes in with the uh, COVID positive. So these are the CDC guidelines I got from the, their website. So these are the, uh, we are getting CDC guidelines and also the resources we're using is the, every state has their health department guidelines. So these two main resources we're using and of course, uh, FDA approves uh, uh, hydroxy hydroxychloroquine and we use that one. And pretty quick, I'm gonna go back on the hydroxychloroquine dosage. So I was talking to the ID today, the one I told you my one of my patient is in ICU right now. So uh, I, I asked her, did you start on hydroxychloroquine? And the, she is not starting on my patient, but she is starting on other patients. And she said she's starting uh, 400 milligram. Uh, basically, she's doing five days of the course, 500 milligram day one, twice a day, and then 200 milligram twice a day for the next four days. But again, please, this is not for the uh, outpatient setting. This is I'm talking about patient uh, intubated in ICU setting. So please, uh, I would not recommend to start as a primary care and outpatient setting. All right, so this I'm gonna talk about again pretty quick, uh, disinfecting your facility and someone talk, uh, asked about it. So clean surface uh, using soap and water. And after cleaning with the soap and water, use any disinfectant that is uh, registered, or any household disinfectant. And for the soft surfaces, such as carpets, rugs, we can clean with soap and water. And we can use as an, if they we can use laundry for that. And for electronics, such as tablets, keyboards, computers, we can plan ahead. We can uh, putting some uh, wipeable covers on those uh, uh, electronics, or we can use alcohol-based wipes, or we can use 70% of alcohol to wipe those areas. Again, uh, we have disposable gloves, and uh, over here we're using PPEs, protective, uh, personal protective equipment. Uh, we all have it right now. Again, we're talking about N95 is a face mask we're using that cover 95% of the, all the uh, droplet infection, the airborne. So this is all pretty quick about disinfecting uh, your facility. And the take home points pretty quick again, more than 50% who tested positive for COVID show no symptoms initially. So we have to be very careful, patients are positive, but they're asymptomatic. And again, ACE inhibitors and ARBs, there's no scientific data available currently. And uh, uh, at this time, benefits outweigh risk. So patients with a cardiovascular disease, continue, please continue taking those. And there's no solid data for not using NSAIDs with COVID positive patients. And the uh, nebulizers, it's very important to know that patients, uh, should, we should not use nebulizers, BiPAP or CPAP on patients with COVID positive because of the concern for aerosolization. 
Of course, patients uh, who have chronic respiratory failure, they're already on CPAP, that's a different scenario. So again, steroids are not recommended. And uh, there's a one a plasma transfusion recently uh, has been tried by the, for, to treat the COVID patient recently used by the Houston, in, uh, uh, in Houston, in Texas, uh, Methodist Hospital, but we don't have any proven uh, data at this time but they're using it. And again, last but not least, IV fluid should be used very carefully because the patient with COVID positive, very sensitive to fluid overload. So these are the take home points. And uh, these are my citations and I will stop over here and I will move forward to have a question and answer session. And uh, I would like to answer over here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Chima. That was very, very well done, very concisely uh, given summary for the COVID infection and very nicely made slides. Um, thank you. Um, uh, again, I want to remind all the participants on the uh, webinar today, uh, kindly please submit your questions in the Q&A or you know, if you're having trouble finding the Q&A or putting question in there or accessing it, you can use the chat box uh, and uh, you can put your questions in the chat box uh, as a backup option. Uh, and then the last option is that if you're really not sure about any of these, you can just raise your hand. There is an option to click raise your hand and you can raise your hand and I will try to get to you. Um, uh, try to uh, ask questions related to the presentation today uh, or anything related to COVID-19. This platform is supposed to be a discussion platform for the things we're hearing, things we are experiencing, our observations or something we read somewhere about. Uh, to ask from the speaker and a group of panelists. Uh, so before I go any further, what I would like to do is to ask all our panelists uh, for today to introduce themselves one by one. Uh, you can uh, press the space bar and it will unmute you. And when you let go of the space bar, it will mute you again. And you can go alphabetically as you guys are listed one by one. So I see uh, right after Dr. Asima, Dr. Fawad Chaudhary is listed. We you can start right there. Please go ahead. <clears throat> so, uh, thank you. And great presentation by Dr. Shima. Uh, Fawad Chaudhary, uh, interventional pulmonologist and intensivist. I do sleep as well at University of Oklahoma. Thank you. I'm Asma Chima. I'm working as a medical director in Maryland in one of the subacute long term care facility. And last year I was working with the University of Maryland Shore Regional Health as an attending physician. And uh, today I'm here with you guys to share knowledge and learning and to help work as a team together. Together, everyone achieves more. Thank you. Dr. Fizia? Yeah, Assalamu alaikum. I'm Dr. Fizia. I'm Erika from Indus Hospital, Karachi. I'm the internist and infectious disease specialist. Thank you. Dr. Majid? My name is Majid Shafiq. I'm a in an interventional pulmonologist and uh, an intensivist at uh, Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston. Excellent talk today and uh, great to be here. Thank you, welcome. And uh, Dr. Rizwan Khalid. Anji, Islam alaikum. Uh, Rizwan Khalid, uh, cardiology, KCUMB. Um, I'm, uh, I uh, was in another meeting, so I just uh, came briefly. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Chima, uh, for your presentation. And I'm uh, so glad to see uh, Majid Shafiq, one of my very good friends uh, and the junior from Aga Khan joining in today. Um, so hopefully we'll see Dr. Shafiq, um, you know, participating more as panelists and hopefully um, as, uh, you know, presenting uh, as well in the near future. Thank you, Majid, for coming today. Thank you, Danish and Shahid Bhai. Very much my pleasure. Great to be here. Thank you. Thank you, Rizwan Bhai. I want to tell everyone that uh, Dr. Rizwan Khalid is president-elect of APNA and will be taking over as president next year and a truly dynamic guy. I am so appreciative, Rizwan Bhai, that you're here every day uh, supporting us and for your wonderful presentation yesterday uh, about the cardiology, cardiac issues in COVID-19 infections and your experiences. I truly enjoyed it. So it's a great recording to watch if you missed the webinar yesterday. It's on our YouTube channel. Uh, Dr. Shahid Rafiq, please go ahead and introduce yourself. Shahid Bhai, you are muted. Please unmute and introduce yourself. Yes, Assalamualaikum, Shahid I'm a neurologist and uh, chair of the Maryland. Fred Maryland. Um, uh, that's it. Uh, thank you for today. 
Um, thank you all. Very good, thank you. So uh, we have a few questions that we can begin with. And I would also, uh, um, you know, there was some introduction to the event management in our presentation today, but if you have any tips or suggestions or advice about uh, the issues of event management by, you know, non-intensive as someone who really runs into uh, this as a GP or as a non-neurologist or as an ID doctor, um, please share that when you get your turn to speak uh, as a panelist. Um, so I will put the questions to the, spe to the speaker and then after uh, uh, her answers, if any of the panelists wants to add to it, please feel free. You can unmute yourself. You can press the space bar on your keyboard and it will unmute you as long as you hold it. And when you let go, it will mute you again. So the first question, Dr. Chima, is from Dr. Noor Mahal Kabani. And she's asking um, about the GI symptoms in regards to um, the COVID-19 infection. And I think she made a comment that there was even a presentation late, uh, one or two weeks later with the GI symptoms. Um, and uh, how often are you seeing it? Have you seen it? Or uh, what would you like to add about this uh, aspect? Yes, I have one patient uh, in my center right now. Is COVID uh, testing is still pending. She has, a, I think she's a 65-year female, history of COPD, and stage COPD. And she came in for the rehab. And we were planning to discharge on 31st of March. And that day, uh, when I go, went to see her, she said, I have, I'm not feeling well. I said, okay, we checked the temperature. She had a fever. She was spiking fever. And she said she had cough. And same day, she had a light diarrhea, loose tooth. So, but again, uh, I cannot say for sure, but of course there are atypical symptoms. Uh, this is the first case I'm seeing with the diarrhea. And she was, uh, then the next day, she was feeling very bad. She was tachypneic in 40s. We, we transferred her to the ER. They checked for COVID. So they mentioned the most likely viral, uh, respiratory viral symptoms. So we are quarantining her at this time. So results are still pending. Hopefully we're expecting by tomorrow morning we'll have the results. So please keep an eye on those symptoms. So 40% is a lot, a lot of a big percentage. So more than 40% of the cases uh, presenting with the GI symptoms in the cohort studies of 44,000 people, the study done in China. So, and I have seen one patient but again, uh, it's a suspected case and the COVID testing is still pending and I will let you know uh, in a couple of days if I have heard, hear back from them is positive or negative. But she's quarantined at this time and uh, but she has a comorbidities as well, but this is new, new onset diarrhea and the febrile illness. So please keep an eye on the GI symptoms. Don't, don't ignore and fever and GI symptoms. Please, uh, it's again, it uh, depends. Uh, if, the, if you're as a GP, you're seeing the patient, you see, uh, you know your patient well, right? So patient also, if you talk to the patient, patient give you the diagnosis. Patient tells, the chief is looking so good, I'm not feeling well. So I think uh, you will have idea of you seeing the patient more often, but don't ignore those symptoms. This is what I would say. Does any panelists have anything to add? Okay. Before I go to the next question, I would like to acknowledge um, our president of APNA, Dr. Nahid Usmani, uh, has joined uh, our uh, webinar. Uh, I welcome Dr. Nahid Usmani and I request her to introduce herself or make any comments. Dr. Usmani. Uh, thank you, uh, Danish, for uh, introducing me. I'm very happy about this educational uh, APNA Merit Initiative on COVID-19. And uh, I'm very excited to be finally be able to participate in it. Thank you. Thank you so much for, you know, welcome um, for being here. So we'll go on to the next question, uh, which I think is very interesting, is uh, touching on what I was hoping that uh, we'll talk about a little bit. It's from Dr. Morton about um, how easy is it to learn the basic when used by GPs and non-critical specialists? Good question. Uh, you know, I learned during my residency training, watch one, do one, teach one. So this is what I would recommend. Definitely first time uh, you get confidence, just uh, go in the ER and the intensivist, see how they're managing, then do yourself and then teach one. And definitely in the beginning, if you are not ma managing vents since long, just go over the concepts. There are a lot of YouTube videos available these days, or you can approach me, the one I, as much as I know, of course, I don't know much, <laughs> but of course we have intensivists on board. So we have, there's a lot of help available these days. So again, I would say watch one, do one, teach one. This is how you can go and improve your skills. Our panelists. Yeah, I can. 
go right ahead. Sorry, go okay. ahead. No, go ahead, Mazid. It's all right. Thanks, Bavad. I would also add, um, you know, the American College of Chess Physicians has um, made available some excellent resources that are usually uh, not available for free, uh, but for the for a limited time period in this COVID-19 um, era, they have made a few of those excellent videos available. I just put down a link to a really nice video that goes over the basics of respiratory failure management and touches upon the basics of vent management as well. At the end of the day though, every ventilator is a little bit different. Um, so it's just a matter of being familiar with your machine. Um, you might have an anesthesiologist, for instance, who was previously using it at your institution, whomever it was, I think it would be important to meet with that person and get to know your particular machine. Once you know that, then there's plenty of um, online resources available that can take you from there. Yeah, I think uh, I totally agree what Madhid has been uh, has mentioned. And also, Dr. Shima, I think you uh, uh, One thing is um, volume control versus pressure control. You were, you explained it very well. In ARDS patients, um, basically we have to keep the plateau under 30 and a peak under 40. And these patients do better with high peak uh, in general. And uh, there is some aspect of driving pressures where, which we don't have to go, it's more complicated. So the idea in ARDS is to improve the oxygenation. So we can sometimes tolerate high CO2 levels just to improve oxygenation i just simplify it to if most of us or most of the non-intensivists will learn the volume control when we call it volume it, it means that pressure you can control the volume but pressure will depend on the lung stiffness and lung becomes more stiff because of ARDS so bottom line is don't worry about CO2 too much improve oxygenation by keeping the high peep phenomena but again, I think our vent management will go into more details. Uh, whatever Dr. Chima has mentioned, uh, in simple words, that will work. The tidal volume, rate, FiO2, and PEEP. If you know these four parameters, I think you can manage by a little bit of a video and a little bit of a class. Thank you. Yeah, I would add on this, just a basic vent. This is in the basically time buying by the time they will reach you guys. <laughs> in ten, so they can have, uh, just save the life and call you guys to be on board. I mean, whoever in Pakistan or over here. So it's basically yeah. it's a non-intensivist. And of course, there's a lot to learn. Definitely, I will attend. Uh, if you're going to present or defend, I will learn more about it. Thank you. Exactly. And, and that's more, most institutions are doing it. Even right. today, in our institution, we were talking about uh, going over with non-intensivists. Because right. that will happen in most institutions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Dr. Harikar, what's your experience in the Indus hospital? Are you guys running into this problem? Are you thinking about this issue of uh, having too many patients needing IC or vent management? Yes, well, in, in this hospital, we have anesthesiologists uh, leading it. We don't have an intensivist per se from the medicine or pulmonologist leading the ICUs. However, when the COVID unit was formed and uh, I uh, am leading it as the clinical lead for it. We have provision of eight vents, but the whole facility, which is a 26 bedded facility, can be accommodated with ventilators. We don't have uh, the uh, you know deficiency of donations, uh, but the point is that we have limited to the eight vents is just because of manpower. Our staffing and uh, the capability of uh, running the vent is the problem. So yes, that's one thing we are learning. In my residency, we did uh, have a pulmon uh, pulmonologist intensivist, uh, so we had some training. Uh, it's been a long time since I did my ID fellowship as well. So we are now trying to learn. I have uh, Dr. Samreen, who's also now joined in. She and I are now trying to, you know, learn on uh, site the management of vans and trying to do our best. Uh, and I think this forum would be really uh, crucial for us. Uh, fortunately, we have someone, fortunately for us, who's stuck in Pakistan. <coughs> And cannot go back to America. He's also a pulmonologist and has, has volunteered uh, to come over and help us through. So yeah, we are doing it with the help of NSC's all. Of 
Very good. So uh, before I move on to the next question, I saw that Dr. Muhammad Naeem had his hand raised. So uh, Dr. Naeem, please go ahead with your <coughs> comment. Thank you, Dr. Danish. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm very late to join this uh, session now. Uh, I just, uh, I'm very much concerned about the failure of the backbone of medicine line, medical line, that is general practitioners in the field. That uh, most of the majority of the uh, uh, general population of diseases, they are ignored because they are not, they are because of fear and concerns about them. They are not doing practice like that uh, before that. What do you advise uh, that uh, in the in the field, the two uh, most of the most of the doctors are not doing practice uh, at the moment. Uh, what uh, what you take steps to come and uh, to. Uh, take part actively in the management of the general as well as the other diseases in the field, in the periphery or in the, uh, in the general, for the general public. Thank you. Dr. Naeem, you mean uh, in the setting of the COVID positive cases, you mean? Of course, you know, everyone is concerned about these days about COVID exposure. So if you are talking from their standpoint, then I can say the telemedicine is the best option at this point. Many uh, practices over here in the States doing the same thing. There are many telemedicine companies on board. And of course, uh, the pri private practices, uh, they are seeing their established patients even via Skype, via Zoom, via phone calls. Their insurance is paying for that. And, uh, but of course, they cannot see the new patient, but there are many telemedicine companies who are helping to see uh, in such a scenario. So of course, uh, all physicians are concerned about it because of exposure. And the other reason is because there's a shortage of uh, PPE supply over here, all over the states. And of course, uh, that's the main concern. And uh, that's the reason over here, we uh, were limited to see the patient, but we have other options, telemedicine is the best option. And I heard there are many in, the, uh, in Lahore, I heard that uh, it has been started, telemedicine, Fatma Juna University, uh, thinking Edward, if I'm not wrong, please correct me if someone knows about it. So I heard they have started there. So I think this is that we can encourage the GP. They have established patients. They, they, they have their contact numbers that approach them by phone. And uh, it's, it's the time that GP has to stand up and the, uh, they can do by the teleconference call to make sure their patients are safe. And uh, of course, uh, I understand the rural areas is a tough uh, situation in the rural areas. But of course, in the uh, city areas, this is I can recommend telemedicine and teleconference call. They can help their patients. Um, I, I also want to just quickly add to that, that uh, I agree with Dr. Jima that even here in the United States, general practice and non-essential clinical care has been slowed down. Uh, one, to free up the physician force to work with the COVID patients if needed. And two, to not run out of those uh, PPE and three, to reduce the spread because of non-essential care. So, you know, I, I practice neurology and Parkinson's disease. So 90% of my patients have been canceled for the next two uh, months. And even the ones who need follow-up or having issues, I'm doing it on phone call or video conferencing only. So there is no face-to-face -face contact unless it's very essential. So I still have done some Botox injections for some essential cases, but no face-to-face -face contact and no in-clinic contact. So that, you know, actually is kind of uh, be becoming a standard practice in the U.S. And does the panelists have anything to add? Yeah, I think uh, uh, Danish is exactly the same uh, situation, um, you know, here as well. Not only uh, the clinics um, uh, and the freedom of the workforce for, uh, you know, for the surge, but also all the ORs, like 80% to 90% of all the elective procedures are canceled in every specialty and all the emergent procedures are being done. So it's, uh, it, it's the new norm for the next couple of months. All right, thank you. Uh, Dr. Kabani, you had uh, any comments yes. today? Um, I will just add to the comments already made, but I, I, about the using telemedicine and teleconsults. The uh, only other thing I would say is that there are apps that are coming out. One of them is called iConsult, uh, that you can actually uh, connect in the states, they, they are HIPAA compliant and you can connect with your patients 
um, uh, even within the hospital to save the use of PE, uh, PPEs going in and out of rooms uh, several times a day, especially for the nurses and also families can connect. So that is one more option. The other was a question for the physicians in Pakistan. I would like to know predominantly what um, company or model make ventilators they are predominantly using because if we were to do a demo, it would be helpful to know uh, that we do something that is appropriate for, for them. Uh, and maybe not, they're all different ones, but it would be good to have a list of the vents that they use. Thank you, Dr. Kabani. Um, I'm gonna go towards uh, Dr. Samreen Sarfaraz, who has also joined us from Indus Hospital, who has a few questions, but uh, I also would request her to introduce herself her uh, specialty, her role and in institution, and, and then she can go through some questions and I uh, also have the list of those questions. Dr. Samreen, uh, please go ahead. Uh, Asalaamu As Alaikum. Uh, my name is Dr. Samreen Safraz. I'm working as an infectious disease consultant at the Indus Hospital uh, with Dr. Fivzia Heriker, managing COVID patients in the COVID units, um, in the COVID unit at Indus Hospital right now. Do you want to go ahead with your question, Dr. Sami? Uh, so I had a couple of questions. Uh, the first was about the experience of remdesivir and what side effects have you guys seen and um, your experience, the improvement observed, that is one. The other is um, about plasma, conval convalescent plasma use. Um, uh, when to use it because I think it should be used in the early course of disease rather than late and what should be the indications and has it been used uh, in America and uh, what's the experience. The third is the outcome of patients with ARDS who get ventilated. How many have you extubated successfully after intubation? Because over here in our experience in Karachi, I asked yesterday, none of the ventilated patients across the city have yet been excavated. There is a person who has been on the vent for 21 days in Ahan and uh, the PCR is negative twice, but uh, he's still ventilated because of lung fibrosis. So what's the experience in America? All right, so let me go over. I, I think you missed the presentation. I already talked about remdesivir. It's, a, under, it's an investigational drug. It's IV drug uh, antiviral therapy to inhibit the replication of the viral load. But at this time, it's not approved. It's under trial phase, so I will not recommend to use it in the ICU setting at this time. Secondly, you ask about the plasma transfusion. So this uh, one study, uh, I think in the um, Houston Methodist Hospital, I mentioned in my presentation, there's a one uh, over started over there, but it's still, it's not approved by FDA, so I will not recommend to start doing over there. Yes, one thing that FDA approved at this point is hydroxychloroquine, but again, it's not a proven modality, but we don't have any other option at this time. So it can help to uh, do this, uh, help with the severity of the condition. And over here, uh, I spoke to my, one of my ID, when my, one of my patients is admitted to ICU, and uh, she is uh, using hydroxychloroquine for five day trial basis. Again, it's not approved, but I can suggest you in the for only for the emergency situation in ICU patients, not for the primary care, not for the outpatient setting. So please, because of side effects. And the data shows that patient who were taking hydroxychloroquine has been positive for COVID, uh, COVID, COVID positive. So you have to be very clear about it that no primary care should use as a outside outpatient setting, but yes, FDA approves to use it as an emergency use. So uh, you can use a uh, hydroxychloroquine, 400 milligram BID day one, then 200 milligram BID for next four days. This again, is varies from case to case because elderly patients come in with a lot of comorbidities. So you have to keep in mind uh, because they will be on a lot of antipsychotics. So the QT prolongation is a concern. So you have to cut off the antipsychotics and monitor their EKGs, monitor their QT prolongation. That's the main thing. So it's not proven, but FDA has approved we can use it for emergency situation. And your third question was how many patients has been extubated? Uh, I will leave this question for the intensivist who are working the, in the ICU settings. So I think um, Dr. Kaleem, Dr. Majid on board, they can help us with that question. G. Fawad, please go ahead. So um, uh, a very good question. So regarding, uh, can you hear me? Yep, yep. Okay, so regarding the first question regarding the convalescent serum. Um, so there is a study published um, in March 27th 
experience of five patients in China. And um, uh, the indications that you were asking, again, in US, we don't have much experience as, as to my knowledge, but from that study, which is very recent, it is, they applied it on patients uh, post-viral antiviral therapy who were very severely sick with PF, PAO2 by FIU to ratio of less than 300 and who were rapidly progressing. All five, uh, four out of those five patients did do better. I think in two to three days time, their fever uh, went down. And uh, all of these patients, if I'm not mistaken, survived four for sure. And the data goes up to more than 30 days. So they survived, four of them got discharged. So that tells us that there is that definitely read through, through that paper. It gives us a very good idea of how, although it's a very small study, five patients, but that's, that's the best we have so far. So that means that if you have, just by extension, uh, again, we need more studies, patients who are progressing despite TOSI versus um, uh, antiviral rem remdesivir, with a severe ARDS, uh, try them uh, early on and then see what happens uh, from that small study I can uh, say. That's regarding first question. Regarding the second question, um, I think we discussed um, uh, another day as well. There is no con concrete data in US at this point, what is the mortality? Italian data, a, a more than 60% mortality um, on the ventilator patient, so is Chinese data. In US, we were checking two days ago, mortality on patients who go on the ventilator is still close to 50%. Okay, but this is all uh, changing, but it's a very high mortality um, because of the reasons, uh, partly it's because overwhelming of the system, but partly just because the disease progresses rapidly. Um, I'm not sure if there is anything um, else that we know as of now regarding how many patients will survive. I think time will tell. Maybe Majid may have some, uh, some opinion about that as well. No, I, I think I agree what we've we seen as far as the natural history of diseases is concerned. And again, I'll preface it by saying, you know, we're all learning more and more about this disease with every passing day, certainly every passing week, right? Uh, but the natural history of disease is such that those who do get sick enough to require mechanical ventilation, uh, it takes several weeks uh, we had, a, you know, and this is just an anecdotal N of one um, sort of an example, but um, in our ICU, we had an 82 years old woman with a lot of comorbidities who went on the ventilator, had proper ARDS, uh, got extubated after two and a half weeks and went home as well. Uh, mashallah, right? So that happens sometimes. Uh, but the reality is that these people, they take a long time on the ventilator. Um, if there are obviously no signs of recovery, I would, um, I would uh, practice my usual good critical care, my usual ARDS prognostication um, to the best of our knowledge. Uh, that's, uh, you know, there's every reason to believe that if somebody isn't progressing uh, positively after several weeks on the ventilator, then you start thinking about the next steps, be it a tracheostomy or thinking about goals of care and such, just like you would for any other patient. With that said, though, we still don't know uh, because this is a new disease for us. Thank you. Um, I uh, see that uh, Dr. Abdul Hafiz has raised his hand. Dr. Hafiz, please uh, introduce yourself and make your comments. My name is Dr. Abdul Hafiz. Uh, I'm the CEO of Association of Pakistani Physicians in the United Kingdom, APS UK. Um, thank you, Danish and Dr. Chima. Excellent uh, presentation. I just would like to make a few comments, few observations, which we have to share probably from UK, uh, because we are obviously seeing a very uh, big spike uh, as well as a lot of mortality. Um, here, my, my, my primary specialty is a family physician. So obviously, um, some of the observations are what we are discussing in our group here. Um, so obviously, because I'm not the ICU consultant, but obviously I had discussions at uh, that point of view. I think there was a point made regarding the management in primary care. So as a primary care physician, obviously, as um, I think everybody is now aware, 
Um, majority of patients, 80% have mild symptoms and about 15% are in the moderate category, which probably need hospital admission. The one which are mild to moderate category, we obviously the only thing which we can do in the primary care setting is to start some sort of antibiotic in terms of preventing a secondary infection coming in uh, and making things worse. Uh, and then obviously when we move into the moderate category, these patients, most of them need oxygen uh, and just a hospitalization and then monitoring in terms of how they progress from there. Um, the third category, obviously, as um, has been mentioned, is about 5% or nearly around that figure will probably need more intensive care and then maybe intubation and so on. The experience from intubation point of view, what uh, obviously has been shared with us is that these patients do not maintain oxygen and then obviously they gradually um, you know, deteriorate. So the doctors or ICU consultants here have been actually these patients in a prone position um, just to keep the oxygen levels going as much as possible. And in terms of fluids, there was a mention in terms of trying to avoid fluids. So the, the experience here is that we actually, uh, or the here have been actually stopping fluids completely. Uh, the urea levels have been shot up in hundreds and so on, but that's the only way to keep, you know, some oxygen going because these patients rapidly deteriorate and obviously fluid overload uh, or uh, fluid deprivation is probably used as a therapy. Um, the recovery, obviously, there was a question regarding mortality rate in patients who are intubated. The figure here is around 75%. Um, I mean, obviously, it's variation uh, from center to center, but that's roughly, and the recovery time is about same, but I think has been mentioned about two to three, three weeks time. Um, last point I would like to make was regarding GI symptoms. I think there was some um, paper where, which is suggesting that the patients who actually have GI symptoms, they take longer to clear the infection uh, as opposed to patients who have just lung symptoms. So that's actually taken as a you know, extra pressure. If there are GI symptoms, the uh, PCR negative negative status takes much, much longer compared to the rest of the patient. Thank you. I do uh, want to add a quick comment um, regarding mortality. This is Fawad, by the way. Um, uh, as I said, uh, currently it seems like 50%, but I do want to mention that we should not uh, uh, take it as a fixed number as we have all discussed because things are changing and it's system overload is definitely a part. I'll give you an example. In our center, we are not overwhelmed. And out of last week, four patients or five, I think there were four patients here. All of them have not have been extubated. Three of them have been extubated and they were they all got dosi. One of them is going back to get intubated. So we are not doing anything different than the other centers. Same principles, early proning, and using medications, but we are not overwhelmed at this point. So I think that's important to keep in mind. As Majid mentioned, very rightly, do practice good ARDS measures. I think we should have lower mortality than 50% if we do not overwhelm the system. Thank you. Thank you, Vaughan. So, you know, I see there is a bunch of questions still pending, and then I still see some attendees who are wanting to make comments. Um, uh, I think uh, we'll uh, try to maybe then quickly get some comments from those couple of attendees who are interested um, and then uh, probably keep the questions for next sessions and, and close it because we're running our time. So I invite uh, Dr. Uh, Muhammad Naeem uh, uh, to make his comment. Dr. Naeem, please go ahead. Uh, Dr. Kabani, please go ahead and make your comment. Okay, Dr. Azim, please uh, go ahead and uh, make your comment.
Okay. You know, I think there might be some problem with the system here and rather than wasting everybody's time, let me just invite Dr. Shahid Rafiq to close the session for today and we can continue this conversation uh, from tomorrow. Dr. Shahid Rafiq. Um, thank you again for a very um, helpful and um, informative session. I think I am really, um, every night I'm uh, with this forum. Um, speaker, Dr. Chima, and um, uh, the panelists, as well as attendees from Pakistan, Manchester, Dr. Uh, Wahid, um, uh, Dr. Hafiz, and, uh, and others. Um, really, uh, all of you make this a success. And hopefully, we'll continue as we're learning. We are going to make a better structure so that it, uh, this activity continue without um, fatigue or uh, without um, this enthusiasm fizzling out. So um, we will do it uh, over this weekend and uh, share with you all so that, and, and also we are um, going to um, advertise or inform more Pakistani physicians about this activity so that they can join and benefit from that. Again, uh, thank you everybody. Thank you. Thank you so much.